Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Factory. I'm Heidi and I'm sitting here in Italy. And today I have as my guest C and she is far away on the other side of the pond in California. Um, we did, after the death of my husband, I did uh, a short series about conscious living, conscious dying. And also what we want to talk about is also <laughs> really a conversation that matter, but that matters in good English, I guess. Um, it is also part of that other series because we want to talk about the fear of death in the times of Corona. And before we go into the topic, I would give over to you, see, and you talk a little bit about you as long as you want. <laughs> okay. I, I'm a person that I, uh, from the beginning, I was like, why am I here? What's going on? I almost felt like an alien. Um, from another world, I wondered, what is this life? What am I doing? And it didn't seem like many other people were asking that question. And a lot of people around me seemed unhappy and I couldn't figure out why. Anyhow, I went on a big search starting at a really early age. And, and back then, uh, 1960s, there wasn't I one book in the bookstore about what's happening. Um, my mother ended up teaching in a college and she happened to get a magazine called Psychology Today. And I opened it up one time and I, I saw an ad, it said consciousness training. And I'm like, you know, I think consciousness might have something to do with what I'm trying to figure out. Um, so I went on a big search, starting with the Rika Consciousness School. This was when I was 18. Um, and I ended up in spiritual communities. I spent 14 years in one um, with a guru and we meditated an hour twice a day. Um, moved past that, ended up finding another spiritual teacher. Um, so I've done a lot of seated meditation and a lot of seeking to a point where I don't seek anymore, which is fabulous. <laughs> um, because seeking is so useful, but it's also suffering because it's always a goal somewhere out there, something that you've got to find. And um, really the best spiritual teachers will direct you. I want my 14 years with the one teacher he always said, look at me, put all your attention on me and you'll get it somehow. That didn't work for me. Um, I finally found a teacher, Nomi in Santa Cruz, uh, who teaches Ramana Maharshi. And the focus there is look inside yourself, the answers inside yourself. So after 14 years of struggling, trying to find it outside of myself, um, I finally got the message, okay, look in, which is a huge thing. It seems so simple, but most people keep striving and striving to find something outside. Um, so I spent quite a few years with that teacher. Um, I should say the other main element in my life is art. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you because I see this beautiful art. picture behind you and how did you get to, to, to do art? Um, well, just kind of starting to do it in the beginning as a way to process, really. Even when I was little, just um, I was kind of a introverted child, I would say, and it's just a way to be, <laughs> to be with yourself and to process uh, what's happening around you. So I went on to art school. Um, at the same time, I was spiritual seeking as well. Um, and so I have been able to use it to express myself 
and to explore. But the art has always been about the same thing, which is consciousness, pure consciousness. And so trying to uh, uh, express that has been challenging and fun and interesting. A lot of times you'll see an eye in my paintings. And one time my friend says, I don't know, I don't like this eye always staring at me. And I was like, what? <laughs> because I always thought of it as the eye within us, within each person, the inner eye. I never thought of it as, as an objective eye. Um, so that really helped me understand, like to try harder and um, explore deeper to try to communicate this thing that's really unspeakable. So I speak about it in words. I've written a few books on consciousness, um, which is not as easy for me as the painting that comes much more fluid. But really my whole life has been about communicating in one way or another, this inner self that we all are. Yeah, and that is so important in these times now, in my opinion, because people are so concerned about the outside life, you know, how will the next day be and how will the government, what will they do and blah, blah, blah. Will I be infected by this damn virus or somebody else? And, you know, it's all a research in the outside world and trying not to lose what we had in the outside world, fearing that something could change. So, uh, what do you think about this this present moment in from this perspective um well i heard uh someone say it's a sacred pause and i thought that was a beautiful way to look at it a sacred pause um in many spiritual traditions they have the kind of sections of life where you're making your family and your you know businesses but then at the end of your life, you more seek it, um, your spiritual practice, you know, really dig into your spiritual practice. And like, we're given this gift right now of a pause, like time to stay home and reflect. Actually, it should have been also Sunday times ago in, in the Christian uh, religion, no? that you have some time to, to, to pause, to not do the normal things. And also the, the fasting, you know, that would also yeah. be a purification times, which we originally had and we have completely forgotten. And so it seems that somebody, someone, something, some energy has forced us into back into this time to reflect. And I do think I would like to say that everybody in this world is beginning to reflect at least to some degree in this yeah. moment. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think um, from a more cosmic point of view, I, from the tradition I come from Advaita Vedanta, we believe that this whole world is illusory, much like a dream. So, and in my meditation, I really feel that, and I've also explored dreams quite a bit. And um, I think that many people understand that the present moment is really the only real thing. Like everything that's happened behind you, the past is, is in your mind. It's a thought in your mind. And then everything in the future is also a thought in your mind. So this present moment, whatever it appears to be, whether it's, you know, you're being very successful or there's a horrible pandemic, it's still like a dream. It's it, just like a dream is so real when you're in it. This present moment seems so real. And, it, and you're like, well, how can it be a dream? It's like so solid, so real. But if you look at the bigger picture, there's one thing that's real and that is who's aware of the dream, like, this consciousness that's aware of this present moment, you know, that's aware of the dream in the night, you know. 
So it's just a little bit prior to thought where you, you sink into this kind of um, the awareness of the present moment. So, I mean, when we speak of fear, it's like the only real, like nothing bad is happening to me or you, to most of us right in this moment. We're happily in our cozy homes. Um, so the fear is really just a thought. So what you can do is um, unravel that. Like you, what is the exact thoughts that add up to this fear for you? You know, is it loss of family, loss of comforts? Maybe you're afraid of pain, but it, all those things are just thoughts. And then if you feel into who's aware of these thoughts, like who or what, is the consciousness that's, that's prior to those thoughts, then you're not stuck in the thoughts anymore. You're like, sink into something that's very much closer to yourself. This is a, a beautiful concept. And you said before that the only thing which is real is the entity who is witnessing, who is seeing this, who is conscious of, of, of what is happening. And with this definition, I would say that most people are not real. I mean, <laughs> life is not real for most people because I think behind this fear we were talk, uh, are talking about is the, the um, desire to not wake up from the dream, to not even realize that it is a dream. To, to not even realize that life could be different because it's so much a habit. We are so full of um, pretension that everything has to go as the ego wants it to, to be. So that we fear when we get aware of this consciousness of this ob observation uh, way so that we could live in the in the present we would lose everything so what what could you tell people who have this let's say it's not even a fear it's it's this just uncon complete unconsciousness and being therefore stuck in fear or in regrets or in you know in the past or in the future but not not just now in the moment to to be able to appreciate how beautiful it is now springtime you know how oh, normal <laughs> you know <laughs> right well i think we can just look to our ordinary life um there's times in our ordinary life where we don't have a self like if you have an orgasm all of a sudden everything's gone and that is not uncomfortable. <laughs> so what it, sometimes even when you sneeze, everything's gone and it's not uncomfortable. Like there's times that just happen naturally. Sometimes when you just laugh, you, you forget everything and you've not even yourself, you know, you're not your little entity that you usually assume that you are. And, but the best example, and Raman Maharshi goes over and over this, is the best example is sleep. Deep, dreamless sleep. You have no sense of your usual egoic self, but yet we all love deep, dreamless sleep. We all want to make our beds wonderful, and we all can't wait to like let go of this go, 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 and me, me, me. We're so happy to let it go. So I think um, that's a good reminder and just an ordinary example of, we really do love to be our true selves, which is not encumbered by qualities. It's not encumbered by ideation. It's not encumbered by anything at all you know it's birthless it's deathless it's silent 
we actually really love silence, even though we're many of us addicted to our thinking. You know, once you get into that I, it just goes. So the it's a great time to to take practice. I forgot to say I spent a lot of time working with dying people in hospice, partly just because I was curious about how people deal with that, you know, what what's people's experience. And um, I would say, don't wait <laughs> till the end of your life to practice as, you know, it's, it takes some doing to, to actually find your real self where you're not going to be afraid uh, to, to lose this fleshy body, be, you know, from my point of view, this fleshy body never was who I am, you know, so if you spend so many years assuming that's who you really are, it's not going to just come undone in a minute. And, and it's not like it's uh, impossible to like all of a sudden wake up on your deathbed, but it's not likely from what I've seen. And many people are, and especially the most religious people I found can be extremely fearful at, at death. So I think we could take the sacred pause as a wake up call to um, just take a minute. You know, there's many paths to awakening. Um, so choose one and dig into it during this uh, sacred pause that we have. And it doesn't have to be a, a, a big hard thing. It can be just a joyful thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I wanted to say first, what you described also was a little bit like being in flow, being in the present, being, for instance, with painting or with music or whatever you really like to do. There, the concentration is so great on that, what you are doing, that you forget what will be later and what will be before. That could be a good practice too, at okay. least at first. And then maybe spiritual practice is a good thing for some people, for some maybe something else, you know, maybe sure. doing music or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, going back to the death thing, um, I noticed my husband already before he knew he would die, he came into a, um, a state of acceptance and also state of uh, compassion. When he heard the news, for instance, he often shed tears about what is uh, going on in the world. And he was, you know, grateful at the same time for the life he had. And he was very aware of uh, the big steps he did during his life and that he was fortunate to, you know, to arrive where he has arrived. So it does, he didn't do a regular spiritual practice. So it's not necessarily that we sit on the cushion, in my opinion, for two hours a day or even longer, because this can also be a project of, <laughs> of trying to, to shape reality as we want it to be. So I wonder what, what you, you said you did uh, at, Van, uh, at Vida, Vedanta. And uh, what, what else could people do who are not willing to, to go so deeply into a tradition, especially if, if it is from a completely different culture? Do mm -hmm. you have some, apart from, from painting, obviously? <laughs> yeah, well, I think that each person probably knows what that is for themselves. If you think, you know, what has made me slow down? What, is, what activities have made me feel the most happy? Then that can be your spiritual practice. No matter what it, it is for you. It could be cooking, you know, gardening. Yeah, exactly. That's for me at the moment. I took on gardening again and I feel happy. Also my body, you know, after several hours of digging and doing things, my body says, oh, it's enough. <laughs> it's sort of a satisfaction, which is different, which yeah. is 
you know, enlivening. So, and being out in nature, working on the ground, digging in the ground, you know, planting plants, giving water, taking care for the garden, yeah. fighting with the weeds too, but <laughs> whole life is mirroring that. <laughs> yes. And, and maybe perhaps noticing who you are in those moments when you're not having that extra baggage of thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just being aware of, of yourself. Because you can use that on your deathbed or in these crises, coming back to that peaceful you you know so the more you practice that peaceful you without all the thinking um you won't have to be gardening or cooking or whatever it is you do you'll you'll be so familiar with that i guess we could call it peaceful you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah so i think this is for somebody who is so used to live in the outside world it's so difficult to notice these things to be aware of what you are doing, who you, who, who you are in that moment. I remember for a long, many years, I was not aware at all. And then at a certain moment, I realized that I was not aware before, that I had no way of knowing that. Right. Then I, I went into the trap when people said, you should not think, think no thinking. And then I tried to, uh, to, to extinct all thoughts, you know, and that made it even uh, worse. Yes. So can you maybe um, describe what that means to be in the present without thinking? So there is also, a, as I know, um, a Vipassana a, a tradition who is naming what is going on. So they are using words who are obviously in your mind, but this is not the thinking you are talking about. What is that thinking which we can leave aside? Well, you can't understand it when you're in it. You know, if you're in the thinking mind, you're not going to, you can only understand it when you're prior to it. But a good tip is there's actually a space in between thoughts. It's not like thoughts are jumbled, jumbled, jumbled together, there's a space. I do think, for me, I don't know how else to do it, but just be quiet and notice and come in, if that makes any sense to you, come into yourself instead of thinking. Is it helpful maybe to concentrate on your body on, on, on the body sensations or also on the breathing? I know there's many traditions that do that. I, I would not recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It depends where your practice is, you know. So. It's true. There's, there's many, many branches that come to the same trunk, you know. The yeah. Same. So. They know we're all one and of course, we all will arrive at the same answer because we are exactly the same one. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and even if we don't arrive at it, we're already there. We're already here. So, I, you know, that whole idea of struggling to find peace. Yeah, uh, I had to struggle. <laughs> um, so, it's a little bit already, like you definitely arrive at the place where you started and where you already were so yeah it's sort of a contradiction no struggling to find yeah. peace like like uh, making war to make peace uh, yeah. things like that oh, no that's yeah. just yeah. something which uh -huh. doesn't work so much but i i would like to go to the work you did in the hospice because i'm really interested uh -huh. what did you find about uh the people who were dying and also about the people around um, uh, who were not dying, obviously, but who were, uh, were about to lose somebody they love. Uh, why is it so problematic? 
And did you find a way or see a way how you could help these people? Well, I, th I think the why of why it's so problematic is because our society does not look at death. You know, our whole lives, we don't talk about death. We hide children from death. Um, let's start talking about death, you know, and it's not a sad thing. We, uh, if you work, you know, the garden is a good example. Things are dying all the time, but things are being reborn all the time. So why do we cut out that one phase of exactly cycle that, you know, because we're so afraid and, and we become so attached to our loved ones. And then what, it, what are we afraid about? What is it? Why, why did we uh, expel this topic? Because in former times, people died at home, the children were around, it was a normal thing. Uh, death was part, of, was part of life. Today, it's obviously not. And why not? Do you have an idea? I think a, a historian could tell you that better than I. I don't know why. All I know is that let's start right now and talk about it and um if you have someone that's dying near you i think just being present with them i when i was a hospice spiritual caregiver i had this great episcopal priest and he said see all you have to do is listen you just have to sit there and listen and uh, that is the biggest gift you can give anyone is to listen to them. Everyone wants to be heard, and especially when they're dying. Um, they want to tell their story. They want to feel that they've been valuable and appreciated. And so if you just sit there and, and listen, they will talk. And that is the best gift that you can give them. And it's a, a real if, um, skill to listen. So people can tune in their listening skill. That will really help when someone's passing away. Mm -hmm. And imagine now with the corona uh, crisis, people are dying attached to machines. Yeah. The other people around all covered with masks. There is no human uh, connection and for sure none of the loved ones around and uh, nobody holds your hand nobody is interested in your story because they don't have time what inhumane way of needing to die isn't it truly but if you if you yourself the dying person has that um skill i should could say of being at peace already, it's going to help you tremendously. And you're not going to be in this frantic, what's happening, my loved ones aren't with me. I think that you will know how to be at peace no matter where you are. So good to just start practicing that um, now at, at this time of pause. Yeah. And probably when. One idea is that if you're getting sick and you are old, why go to the hospital? Exactly. That's what I wanted to say. I heard that somebody said, I won't call, I wouldn't call any um, emergency because then they have to do all that to you. Yeah. And even if you have somewhere in your drawer a uh, um, biological testament that you won't be uh, attached on, on the life uh, prolonging machines, but nobody cares in, in these situations no, of uh, immediate necessity. Right. So as soon as you go into the machinery no, of modern technology and medicine technology, you hardly get out. So I heard about somebody who said he would never or his mother, I think it was his mother, she said she, she wants to die at home. And other people, uh, maybe they don't even do the test 
for to know if this is a, a real flu or this flu or something else. They just mm -hmm. wait how it's uh, um, unfolding. A friend of mine did that and she's still, she's convinced that it was a normal flu, but it was five, six weeks, uh, you know, oh, so okay. with all these symptoms, so not all, but that might be a, a good idea, but you know, when the, the, the people around you are so in anxiety because they definitely don't know what to do when you are dying at home, you know? So then you might even say, okay, I better go leave the, uh, t the responsibility, uh, take that away from them and, and undergo this. But then you need to be something like a bodhisattva already. <laughs> isn't it that you are so how can you call that mindful conscious about what the implications are if you yeah. found out uh, that you had the coronavirus and it would be worse and worse and worse what would you do oh i would definitely stay home <laughs> yeah you are well prepared. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, I'm, I'm old. You know, if I was 30, it'd be different, maybe. But I think my, unless my family was adamant that I go in so they can squeeze out another few years out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Some things you do just for the family, I think. People, when they're dying, a lot of people hang on longer than they would just for the family. The family wants a few more words with them, a few more days, even though they're in great pain and suffering. So, I mean, if you are a family of a loved one, let them go. Yeah. Let them go when it's time. Give them that gift of not holding on and trying to drag them into this world um that's uh, coming back to spirituality this is egocentric you know mm -hmm. it's the ego who wants to to first of all not accept that there is mortality and then uh want something for oneself instead of uh, the other person you know yes exactly. it's maybe not the best time to 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 get out with your ego <laughs> I know what? it's it, uh, to the be, it's not the best time to demonstrate your ego desire. Oh, That's what yeah. I said. Also, I really realized that it is difficult when my husband was worse and had metastasis and very much pain and so on. And I told, I said to him, "You you don't have to stay for me. You know, I I can go on in some way. It's it, I will miss you a lot, but you know, you you go when you think it's uh, it's the right time." And he did before it was too bad. He did before he was locked into into a bed, you know. So yeah. it was was great, <laughs> I have to say. And also, this experience shows me, or at least I deduce from it, that you have a sort of a decision power over your death. Yes. Can you talk about that? Well. You can stop eating at any time. <laughs> <laughs> Even that, you know, it's, but. No, I don't mean this obvious uh, decision power no. for starving yourself. I think it's more the, the soul who, who decides that it's time now and, or I still have to wait for some time or I go now. That's what I think. Well, I guess it depends on how attached you are to the body. Um, you may not even feel like the body is you and it'll do what it wants and you know you go on. So the body, could, it's like a, a coat or whatever. The coat falls off and you go on. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if as long as we still 
belief in in the let's say in the importance of the body and that we need to maintain it or to keep it you know maybe for that so many people have to suffer a lot for to be forced into letting go or with other words if we had a good spiritual practice where we could talk like you talk you know uh, uh, not only talk but feel like you uh, presented would we still need suffering at the end of our lives because it seems so pervasive that people in the last times have a hard time well i i mean the body is gonna feel pain we can't really undo that but if you're not attached to the body as yourself, then it will just be like a dream. So it's not something that's gonna grab you and grab your attention and like uh, you'll be absorbed in it because you, it's like you'll be witnessing it instead of being it, it the suffering body. It, you're just witnessing it from mm -hmm. the kind of a pure consciousness. So, I mean, I think, you know, there's good drugs to take care of the pain. It doesn't have to be a terrible thing um, physically, but just be yourself. <laughs> and knowing who yourself is, is the whole key. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? This is the constant question in spiritual yes. training. Yeah. Absolutely. That is the absolute best question. And all and you are, know, actually, from my point of view, that's all you need is that one question, who am I? And that can take you all the way to absolutely knowing that you are not a separate entity in a world. You are the whole ball of wax. You are the whole world. You are the whole cosmos. You are who witnesses this world. And we are all that same one, each and every one of us. When we look inside, we all, all look into the same I. You know, I call it an eyeless eye. It's an eye without a any sense of who it is. <laughs> Difficult to say, isn't it? Truly, but it, so it's just pure, uh, in Advaita we say existence, consciousness, bliss. Three words that mean the very same thing. So it's just your own existence that you come to when you practice. And it's the same beautiful existence for each and every person. Existence, mm -hmm. consciousness, it's not conscious of anything because there's no other objects. It's only pure consciousness. And then it's inherently blissful. So rest That's of a wonderful, Yeah, a wonderful spiritual question. And me came to my mind the, the more psychological uh, answer is, the question, who am I? The answer is, uh, yes, but how many? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's nice too, no? <laughs> I think for, for most people, this is more easily to understand, first of, before uh, the spiritual depths, because they know themselves in different moods and in different occasions that they are. That might be an entrance point to understand that in different situations, you are somebody different, you know? And then, uh, yes. And uh, then when you were a child, you seem to be someone else, but there was still this thread of sameness throughout the whole thing. All your different ages, there was always sort of this I that was always there witnessing the whole deal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember one time I asked a spiritual teacher, I'm like, you mean 
this consciousness, you mean the same consciousness that I have right this second, this consciousness? And he was like, yes. <laughs> I'm like, how can it be that simple? This, it's, it's actually simpler than we think. Yeah, and I think the uh, more complication we, we do, you named it before, it's not consciousness of something. Mm -hmm. You know, we combine with I'm conscious of my body, I'm conscious of, nature, of the tree, of the dog, of the cat, you know, and what is happening. And we, we normally see consciousness in this um, um, way. But you are talking about, how can I call that? Consciousness which is just there, no? That's not, not, um, it might be, have included all these things, but it's not focusing on, on these different things. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, very well said. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, no, it's 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 nice to talk about these things because I think that the, the solution of our problems in the world will be that everyone for themselves go up, wake up, clean up, and uh, you know show up in the world uh, as the ones who we really are. And um, part of what I'm doing here with the Wisdom Factory is to to promote that, to promote that. I, I don't really know the answers, but to invite people like you to talk about that and to find ever more perspectives on life and in this case also on death so that maybe we can contribute that people have a little bit more confidence in life, <laughs> you know. So I'm wondering, do you want to tell me a little bit more before we uh, stop? Also, where people can find you and uh, what you you talked about the two books you have written and um, what else would you offer to to the audience? Well, I wrote two books: uh, the Way of Knowledge, which will actually really explain if you are interested in spiritual practice you can find them on amazon it's called the way of knowledge and the other one is the myth of seeing <laughs> which talks about how there's well it's more of stories but i like the myth of seeing actually is that there's no two things, there's no objects, there's not a subject and an object. And so that's why seeing is a myth. It has something to do with what you just said, Heidi. Um, so those two books are found on Amazon. I'm not really uh, teaching as a, um, I used to give retreats and things like that, but I don't do that anymore. But um, my art website is art, hyphen c dot org so you can uh find an email on there if you want to talk to me i'm happy to talk to anyone about spiritual practice at any time yeah i published all the addresses also on the web page where Perfect. our conversation Perfect. will be publicized and right yeah, i thank you very very much and hopefully we have helped a little bit to bring death back as possibility in life. Thank you, Heidi, for what you do. You're doing a fabulous, wonderful thing, bringing people together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.